Founder Chapter 3. In the morning, the boy's mother did not cook any pork sausage for breakfast. The ham was on the tin top table, but she did not uncover it. Everybody had biscuits and milk gravy. There was a, still a faint smell of ham, but the boy missed the scent of sausage coming up to him as he stood warming himself. He had hurried out and called Sounder and looked under the house before he'd finished buttoning his shirt. But his mother had made him come in. She knew he would be crawling under the cabin, so she made him put on last year's worn-out overalls and a ragged jacket of his father's that came down to his knees. It wouldn't keep out much cold because it was full of holes. The mother put what was left of the pork sausage and the ham in a meal sack. When she had wrapped her walnut kernels in a brown paper bag and tied them with a string, she tied a scarf around her head and put on a brown heavy sweater that had pink flannel outing patches on the elbows. She put the brown package in the basket she always carried when she went to the store. She put the meal sack over her shoulder. I'm taking the kernels to the store to sell them, she said to the boy. She did not say where she was going with the meal sack. She had swung over her shoulder. Watch the fire, child, she said. Don't go out of hollering distance and leave the young ones. Don't lead them out in the cold. Warm some mush in the skillet for y'all to eat at dinner time. I'll be home before supper time. Whatever you do, child, don't leave the children with a roaring fire and go looking for sounder. You ain't going to find him this day. If a stranger comes, don't say nothing. The boy nodded each time she spoke. He thought he would say yes or don't worry, I will, but he didn't. He pushed the younger children back out of the cold and closed the door. As his mother stepped off the porch and started for the road, she began to hum softly to herself. It was a song the boy had heard her mother sing, er, her many heard her sing many nights in the cabin. You gotta walk that lonesome road. You gotta walk it by yourself. Ain't nobody else gonna walk it for you. The boy wanted to run after her. He watched as she became smaller and smaller until the meal sack over her shoulder was just a white speck. The rest of her became part of the brown road in the gray earth. When the white speck had faded into the earth, the boy looked up at the sky. No sun to thaw things out today, he said aloud to himself. His father always spoke aloud to the wind in the sky and sometimes to the sun when he stood on the porch in the morning, especially when it rose out of the far lowland cottonwoods and pines like a great ball of fire. Warm in the cold bones, his father would say. And preparing for a hunt, his father would caution a full moon hanging over the foothills. Don't shine too bright. You'll make the creature skittish. And Sounder, too, sitting on his hunches, would speak to the moon in ghost-stitting tones of a lonesome dog talk. People would be very mean to his mother today, the boy thought. He wondered if she would tell them that the ham had slid across the floor. If she told them, they might just throw it out and feed it to their dogs. They might let his mother keep it and bring it home again. They wouldn't let her keep the pork sausages, for it was wrapped in clean white paper and not cooked. They might push and pull his mother and put her in the back of a spring wagon and take her away too. She would spill the walnut kernels and then she wouldn't be able to sell them and buy, to buy soul bellies and potatoes. The boy had hoped that the sun would shine. It would soften the frozen crust of the earth and make it easier for him to dig a grave for Sounder, if he found Sounder. If Sounder was dead, he hoped no one would come along and see him carrying the grub hoe and the shovel across the field to the big jack oak. They would ask what he was doing. If anybody passed while he was digging the grave, he would hide in the fence row. If they saw him, they might run him off the land. He felt like crying, but he didn't. Crying would only bother him. He would have his hands full of toys or be carrying Sounder's body. His nose would start dripping and be troublesome because he wouldn't have a free hand to wipe it. He took an armload of wood and punched up the fire. Don't open the stove door, he cautioned the younger children. I have to go out some more. He went to his bed and took out Sounder's ear from under the pillow. 
He would bury it with sounder. He smelled his pillow. It smelled clean and fresh. He put the ear in his pocket so the children wouldn't ask questions as he passed them on the way out. He smoothed his pillow. He was glad his mother washed the sheet in the pillowcase every week, just like she did for the people who lived in the big houses with the curtains on the windows. About twice a year, his mother washed a lot of curtains. The clothesline was filled with them, and they were thin and light and ruffled and fluffy. It was more fun to rub your face against the curtains than on clean sheets every Monday. The curtains moving in the breeze were like the sea's foam. The boy had never seen the sea foam before. But his mother had told him that when the Lord calmed the mighty Jordan for the people to cross over, the water moved like ripples, like little ripples, like curtains in a breeze, and a soft white foam made ruffles on the top of the water. The boy had never looked out of a window that had curtains on it. Whenever he passed houses with curtains on the windows, he remembered that if he put his face close against the curtains on the wash line, he could see through them. He thought they were always eyes closed against the curtains looking out at him. He watched the window out of the corner of his eye. He always felt scared until he had passed. Passing a cabin was different. In a cabin window, there were just faces with real eyes looking out. He could go out now, he thought. The wood in the stove had burned down some and it would be safe. Besides, he would be close by for a while. Getting the body of Sounder from under the cabin wouldn't be easy. The younger children would bother him. They would ask lots of questions like, Why is Sounder dead? And will he stay dead? And many more that he would not want to answer. When I'm out, don't be yelling for me. I'll be through in a while, he said to the smallest child who was looking out of the window, his chin barely high enough to rest on the seal. There's no hurry, the boy thought. I have all day, and it's still early. He looked out of the window, too. If you're inside, you look out, and if you're outside, you look in. But what looks both ways? That's a riddle. What's the answer? He directed it to no child in particular. No one answered. What's the answer? The boy repeated, and then he answered his own riddle. The window is the answer. It looks both ways. None of the children paid any attention. I must go now said the boy to his brother and sisters. Before it gets colder, the wind is starting up, so keep the door shut. Sounder had not died in his favorite spot right behind the porch steps, where he had dug a hole well, where he had a hole dug out, and where the boy's father had put two coffee sacks for a pallet. His mother had said, Sounder will crawl to the darkest, farthest part of the cabin. That's why she had made the boy put on his ragged clothes. The boy could not see all the way under the cabin. One at a time, or at one time, rats had lived there, and they had pushed up the earth in some places so that it almost touched the beams. They did this so they could gnaw through the floor from below. He heard his head and shoulders on nails sticking down from above as he crawled. He heard his knees and elbows on broken glass and rusty sardine cans and broken pieces of crockery and dishes. The dry dust got in his mouth and tasted like lime and grease. Under the cabin, it smelled stale and dead, like old carcasses and snakes. The boy was glad it was winter, because in the summer, there might have been dry land moccasins and copperheads under the cabin. He crawled from front to back, looking along the spaces between the beams. Sounder was not to be seen. The boy would have to go back and forth. Maybe Sounder had pushed with his hind feet and dug a hole into which he had settled. The threadbare knees of last year's overalls opened up and his bare knees scraped the soil. His father's long jacket caught under his knees as he crawled and jerked his face down into the dust. Cobwebs drooped over his face and mouth. His mouth was so dry with dust that he could not spit them out. He crawled over every spot under the cabin, but Sounder's body was not there. The boy felt in his pocket. He had lost Sounder's ear under the cabin. It made no difference. It could be buried there. But where was Sounder's body? 
he wondered. Perhaps the injuries on the side of his head and shoulder were only skin wounds. They looked so terrible, but maybe they were not bad after all. Perhaps Sounder had limped down the road, the way the wagon had taken his master and died. Perhaps he had only been knocked senseless, and that was why he zigzagged so crazily running for the cabin. No wild creature could have carried the dead body away. Foxes could carry off dead squirrels and possums, but no animal was big enough to drag Sounder's body away. Maybe the boy, looking under the cabin with the lantern, had caused Sounder to crawl out the other side and die in the brown stock land. The boy was crying now. Not that there was any new or sudden sorrow. There just seemed to be nothing else to fill up the vast last lostness of the moment. His nose began to run an inch. The tears ran down through the cobwebs and the dust that covered his face, making little rivulets. The boy nibbed his eyes with the dirty with his dirty hands and mixed dust with tears. His eyes began to smart. He followed the road the way the wagon had taken his father as far as he dared to leave the fire and the children in the cabin, still in hollering distance. There was no sound of and no sign of Sounder's body. He spiraled the brown stalk land in ever-winding circles, searching the fence rows as he went. Under the jack oaks and the cottonwoods, there was nothing. In the matted scotch broom tangle, he visualized the great tan body as he carefully picked each step. But the dog was not there.